amphibious assault. That's the environment for the Cobra gunship of the Marine Corps, the AH-1J and the AH-1T. The Cobras have a variety of missions throughout the amphibious operation, escorting the transport helicopters during the ship-to-shore movement, supporting their landings with suppressive fire, escorting and scouting for marine armor ashore, helping to control supporting arms, marking targets, and attacking enemy armor with a multitude of weapons. The AH-1J and T are virtually identical, except that the T is a tow cobra, able to fire the tow missile. There are also minor differences in maneuvering ability. Cobras operate in two plane sections wherever possible, for greater firepower and mutual protection. Maneuverability, agility, and small size make them difficult targets for enemy fire. This is an all-weather helicopter with IFR flight capability. It can operate at high altitudes if necessary, up to 10,000 feet. It's fast for a helicopter. Maximum speed in a dive with full ordnance load is 170 knots. The Cobra's prime operating area, however, is close to the deck where it's onto an enemy and passed before he knows it's there. Cruise speed is 140 knots with a mission radius of 100 nautical miles. Visibility is unobstructed from the front seat, where the co-pilot usually rides. Both pilot and co-pilot are protected by armor plates and wear bulletproof vests. All Cobras carry three-barreled 20-millimeter Gatling gun, 750-round magazine. Rate of fire is 650 to 750 rounds per minute. This unusual weapon can be locked for the pilot to fire dead ahead, like a fighter plane. Or it can be trained, depressed, and elevated, fired from a remotely controlled turret by the co-pilot using a telescopic sight unit. The gun can be trained to 110 degrees either side of center. With the wide angles of fire, plus excellent crew visibility, giving the Cobra fast response to threats from any direction. It can be depressed 50 degrees and elevated 15 degrees. Along with the 20 millimeter Gatling gun, there is a choice of other ordnance. The Cobra can carry up to 52 high-explosive and white phosphorus rockets in four pods, with one seven-shot pod and one for 19 rockets on each side. The tow Cobra can substitute four tow missiles for one of the rocket pods on each side, carrying eight tows in all. Other combinations are possible, depending on the demands of the mission. Here is some of the available ordnance. Gun pods with additional Gatling guns firing forward only. Fuel air explosives and flare canisters, each with eight flares, fired in pairs. The Cobra carries a lot of firepower, but if it's loaded with everything it can hold, fuel quantity has to be reduced. Normal procedure is to carry enough fuel for the mission, plus an ordnance configuration tailored to the job at hand. The Cobra's versatility makes it an integral part of the amphibious assault, another weapon in the Marine arsenal. It becomes the eyes of the armored columns. It escorts and defends troop-carrying helicopters. It serves as a spotter for naval gunfire and artillery. It can mark targets for attack aircraft and control all types of close air support. 
Like all these systems, the Cobra exists to work with the ground troops. It is a tool of the landing force commander, assigned to the support of his units at any level, equipped for constant communication with command posts below, so that it can respond to changing needs as the situation develops. The Cobra's first mission in the amphibious assault is usually escort of helicopters carrying assault troops. At least two Cobras are normally used, deployed according to the expected threat and the terrain. In this case, the enemy threat is frontal, so the gunships lead the flight. The Cobras may fly behind if the threat is from the rear, as it often is on returning from the landing zone to the ships. If the enemy is believed to be a threat from all sides, the escorts may change their deployment constantly throughout the flight, but always in planned patterns. Station keeping and attention to schedules are vital during the ship-to-shore movement. The naval gunfire and supporting aircraft may be walking the flight up, laying down fires just ahead. Terrain is used wherever possible to mask the movement of the flight. The Cobras shift position as required by the terrain and by expected opposition. The escorts must be ready to drive off enemy helicopters, but must not leave the flight to pursue an enemy. The Cobras return any fire which could be a danger to the flight, but only long enough to distract the enemy from the transports. While the Cobras engage the enemy, the transports have a chance to get by without damage. At the landing zone, the lead Cobra pulls away from the flight and makes passes over the LZ to see if it's hot. The Cobra may fire 20 millimeter shells or drop fuel air explosives to detonate booby traps and flush out defenders. As the transports approach, the gunships move to their second major task, support of the helicopter landings with landing zone suppression fire. The troops and the transports are most vulnerable during offloading. The Cobras go into a protective pattern above the LZ, usually a butterfly, firing at any targets which could threaten the landing. The attack helicopters may break their pattern to respond to calls from the ground commander for strikes against specific targets around the LZ. The Cobra's job here is protection of the landing. They fly their protective patterns as long as the transports are on the ground. Then normally escort them back to the beach unless the ground troops are in trouble and need their support. The return flight always takes a different route. If the area below is hot, supporting fires may walk the flight back to friendly territory. Again, the Cobra's shift deployment as needed to guard against the most likely threat. The escort mission usually ends at the beach. Now, let's look at other Cobra missions as the amphibious assault proceeds. The Cobras pick up a Marine armored column. Escort and scouting for service convoys is another of their jobs. 
The attack helicopters have standard escort patterns for ground units, just as they do for transport helicopters. If the surface unit comes under enemy attack, Cobras respond with suppressive fire to allow the ground unit to get by, or to cover it as it turns back. The ground commander may ask the gunship to scout ahead of the convoy, conducting reconnaissance by observation or by fire. The Cobras often shoot into suspected defensive positions to draw fire and reveal the enemy. If an enemy position is discovered blocking a route of advance, the ground commander may ask the Cobras to search for an alternate, less well-defended attack route. The task here is to help the ground commander conduct his attack effectively. The Cobras become the eyes and ears of the armored column, expanding its field of view. The Cobra pilot can drop in on a ground commander to discuss a complex situation. This is called a Zippo brief. The ground commander has a set form for the brief. He is able to give the pilots only the information they need for the mission in organized fashion. In this case, the Cobra is to mark a target for jet attack. High-performance jets are unable to slow down to consult maps and pick out targets. A Cobra can sneak out of concealment nearby and mark the target with white phosphorus. Or he can stand off 4,000 meters and lob his Willie Pete rocket onto the target. And stay there to control the mission, advising the jet pilot by radio that the marker is on target for a specified distance off. The Cobra can coordinate supporting fires, popping up from concealment to observe a situation. Most Cobra pilots have completed schools for both artillery and naval gunfire coordination, and can also serve as forward air controllers. In addition to radio contact, Cobra pilots can land at artillery positions for first-hand planning or for passing on of missions. Even though this Cobra is coordinating supporting arms, it carries a variety of ordnance to be ready for any mission assigned. When a Cobra pops up from concealment, it may be for more than observation or control of supporting arms. It may be for direct attack on enemy armor, the tow cobra can be a deadly killer. Two cobras lie in wait. Their primary targets are anti-aircraft vehicles and tanks, then armored personnel carriers. One cobra pops up. The other remains hidden. The lead cobra pinpoints the target location after a quick look, and the co-pilot passes the information to his teammates. The second aircraft then pops up at a different location, and it fires.
After firing, both Cobras take evasive action and move on to the next attack position. An attack on enemy armor may also involve two other Cobras further from the target to divert the enemy's attention and furnish protection for the attacking Cobra. An attack is often coordinated with diversionary raids by other supporting arms as well. Cobras begin to engage with tow when enemy armor gets within 3,000 meters or so of the FIBA, while the enemy is still occupied with other attacking elements. Turn him around, or at the very least drive his troops out of the armored carriers and into the open, where they are slow and vulnerable. That's the object of a tow attack on enemy armor. Those are the tasks of the Cobra in an amphibious operation. Success depends on the aircraft's ability to operate for many types of amphibious ships, and on those ships maintaining a supply of parts and ordnance to support the Cobra mission. Many tasks depend on the Cobra's ability to operate after dark and in reduced visibility, with all aircraft IFR equipped and their pilots fully qualified. Cobra squadrons are ready for immediate deployment at any time, with aircraft, spare parts, ordnance, and all gear ready and marked for embarkation. Cobra squadrons spend about a third of their time aboard ships or at bases away from home. The squadron is in constant training to upgrade proficiency and combat readiness for both people and equipment. It's a long road to combat qualification for a Cobra pilot. It has to be to prepare him for the variety of tasks given to a Cobra squadron. The normal road runs directly from college to officer candidate school for 10 weeks. Then to basic school for six months or so of air and ground tactics. And on to flight school for a year to 18 months, first in fixed wing aircraft and then in helicopters. When he gets his wings, he has about 200 hours of flight time. And he's been in school and training for at least two years, without counting college time. When the new pilot reports to his squadron, he's usually looking at still another year of training to be combat qualified. On escort duty, scouting for an armored column, working with high-performance jets, attacking enemy armor on its own, the Cobra has carved its own niche in the arsenal for amphibious assault. Today, it is an almost indispensable weapon to the Marine Corps. The title of this film may be a little misleading, because to most of you, the AH-1S turret and rocket management doesn't represent the introduction of a new system. Rather, it is a system refinement based on Cobra weapons with which you're already partially familiar. The Chin turret system is a case in point. It has an M197 20mm gun with a capability rate of fire limited to 750 shots per minute on the AH-1S Series 50 ammunition. The turret is electrically driven in azimuth and in elevation. Direct drive DC motors through a gear train supply mechanical power for driving the turret. The servo amplifiers are in the universal turret control assembly located on the right side of the aircraft at the gunner station. Positioning of the weapon is by means of the familiar helmet sight. 
It makes gun control virtually instinctive. By selection where the pilot or gunner looks, there the gun will point automatically. The gun moves left or right in azimuth 110 degrees, a total of 220 degrees. The normal slew rate is more than 80 degrees a second. In elevation, it varies from 11 degrees to 21 degrees up and 50 degrees down. With such rapid turret traverse, be sure when the gun turret is energized that the area is secured. This will prevent someone being accidentally struck by the gun should the turret be rotated. If there is a loss of any electrical power or master arm is turned off, the turret will go to emergency stow position 11 degrees up and 0 degrees azimuth. During ground maintenance operation of turret, the emergency stow circuit breaker should be pulled to prevent the emergency stow from activating. Here's the gun feed system. It is a proven design, classic in its simplicity. Note the similarities between the 7.62 gun feed system on the original AH-1G more than a dozen years ago and the 20 millimeter feed system on your new AH-1S. Conceptually, they are similar systems, but there are many refinements. Here's a small but important example. By activating the loading switch, this electric motor pulls the linked 20 millimeter rounds from the box and pushes them into the section of flexible chute that connects to the gun feeder. This booster motor eliminates the excessive belt pull loads that would be found if the delinking feeder were the only source of power. The booster motor also eliminates the need to manually fill the chute during loading operations. Although this turret is a growth version of the proven M28 turret, the 20 millimeter M197 weapon provides vastly improved combat punch when compared to the 7.62 round. This is test footage of the gun system taken during its qualification at Yuma. But this gun system has been through more than just an extensive Army test program. It is the same weapon which has been in operational use with the Marines on their AH-1Js. So it's a proven system, one which should enter the Army inventory with minimum growth pains. Recoil is obviously a problem with any 20 millimeter cannon. You'll notice this single recoil adapter located above the gun drive assembly. There's also a compensation circuit running to the aircraft SCAS system. This means that appropriate aircraft attitude changes are made through the SCAS whenever the gun is fired. Which leads us to another electronic compensation. It's the way the gun takes its own Kentucky windage, the automatic corrections for aircraft speed and gun attitude. These small sighting corrections are automatically fed to the gun as a target is being tracked throughout the 220 degree field of fire. Turret system test and checkout is a simple routine operation. This single test set will check out the entire system. W1 connects to the aircraft power source. W6 is a multiple lead cable that connects to the gun control assembly through the fairing access door and to the logic control unit and test connector 19J1. Now you're ready for an operational check of the turret system. Use of the test set is detailed in TM-9-1090-206-12 but we'll just briefly look at some of the functions. There are several important safety considerations before starting a system checkout. All wing stores should be downloaded. W3J1 should be disconnected from W2P1. The gun, feeder, and feed system should be clear of ammunition. In short, no ordnance should be on the aircraft. These are all common sense procedures, but they must be done in sequence, so just follow your TM checklist and you'll soon be ready to begin the operational check of all turret systems. You'll find operation of the test set straightforward. There are 16 keys for test selection and command functions, plus reticle, pass, and fail indicators. There are nine separate functional checks, the first being power distribution and test set connection, followed by a test for fixed forward servo stability. There is a check to verify the gunner's turret stow position. There are three TSU tests, tracking, turret depression limits, and a tracking out of coincidence check. Slow turret slew and forcing function are covered in the next test. And the last two tests verify gun trigger application and release. 
When a fail condition exists, there are fault code numbers displayed on the test set. These numbers and the fault code table in the TM will help to diagnose the malfunction in the system. This has been a quick overview of the M197 Universal Turret. You may well ask why call it universal when all we've shown is the 20mm M197 gun. Well, it does accept other weapons. The M134, for example, the proven Cobra minigun, 7.62mm. And perhaps most important of all, growth capability is designed into the turret. So if future tactical needs dictate even larger caliber than 20mm, the system is designed to accept the M230E1 30mm chain gun. Now let's take a look at the rocket management system. Wing stores have been important since the first attack helicopter. And although the stores might not look too different than other Cobra versions, there is a significant difference in capability. This control and display unit is the heart of rocket management. It permits the pilot to select the precise rockets needed for specific mission requirements. We'll use animation to show the relationship between the zones of the display unit and the specific rocket tubes which they control. Zone 1 is the outer ring of rocket tubes on the outboard launchers, a total of 24. Zone 2 contains the top and bottom pair on the inner rings of tubes, again, the outboard launchers. This is a total of 8. Zone 3 is similar to Zone 1, the outer ring of tubes only this time on the inboard launchers, again, a total of 24 tubes. Zone 4 is similar to Zone 2, only inboard launchers again, a total of 8 tubes. Zone 5 is the three center tubes of all four launchers, a total of 12. Now you'll notice that the five zones have thumb wheel counters which can be set to indicate the type of rockets which are loaded in the specific zones by aircraft armament personnel. And just above each zone arm switch is a rounds remaining counter. The LED readout will decrease each time any rockets are fired, so the pilot knows exactly how many rockets and what type he has available. The zone arm switches are located below these rounds remaining readouts. These switches are pictorial and have a symbolic representation of the specific zone of rockets which they control. The first thumb wheel at the bottom of the panel selects rocket penetration in meters, thus enabling the explosion to occur a predetermined distance after foliage canopy penetration. The increments are in 5 meter intervals from 10 to 45 meters. There's also a super quick setting for point detonation. An additional bunker setting will detonate the rocket after penetration of dirt and logs up to 3 meters in thickness. Rate selects three rates of fire, automatic, slow, and fast. In general, the automatic setting will be used since that is the optimum firing rate for the specific type of rockets being used. Mode is a selection of firing. Quad, one rocket from each of the four launchers. Pairs, two rounds, one from each side of the aircraft. And single, one round, alternating from each side of the aircraft. Quantity is a multiple of the mode switch. It varies from one, two, four, eight, and all. So if the pilot selects eight for the quantity and has the mode of quad, the system will sequentially fire 32 of the selected rockets. The range switch activates the computer which sets the M439 fuses. The range is adjustable from 500 to 6,000 meters in 100 meter increments. The range switch has an A automatic position for future use with a fire control computer. Until the FCC is incorporated, the A position sets the M439 fuses for 3,000 meters. The press to test switch can be used either in flight or on the ground. The master arm switch on the armament panel must be in the standby mode in order for the test sequence to be initiated. The test validates the entire subsystem, including all associated aircraft wiring. We have spent quite a bit of time going over the cockpit display unit because understanding what it does and how it manages the rocket system is very important to armament personnel. Obviously, the loader must load specific rockets in their respective zones in order for the system to work correctly. Within each zone, the loading can be random, but different rocket types for each zone must be kept separated. Bear in mind that there may well be times when only partial rocket loads can be used. Warhead, weight, altitude, high ambient air temperature, and full fuel loads 
are factors which can combine to limit the payload that the S can carry for certain stringent missions. Using the bit features of the subsystem, a maintenance technician is able to detect, locate, and correct problems which may occur within the armament loads. Here, a round was not seated properly within the launcher. Or this tube has a rocket which has not had the hook connected. Even defective rocket motor squib can be detected with this bit equipment. Replacement of individual LRUs is easy. Each LRU has a mechanical fault indicator. The flag is tripped any time a malfunction occurs, so replacement can quickly be made. One of the more sophisticated aspects of the rocket management system is the RC Fuse subsystem. This is a completely automatic computer system which sets the fusing of each rocket on an individual basis. It automatically compensates for the up to 20% fuse tolerances and gives each rocket an individual fuse setting to achieve the specific range which has been selected. It's the most sophisticated part of the fire control system, but it requires no maintenance other than replacement of any defective LRU. Repairs of these faulty LRUs present no real problem at the intermediate level of maintenance. A single test set is sufficient to isolate the fault, make a diagnosis, and enable you to make repairs. The whole rocket management system has been designed for high reliability and maintainability. No introduction would be complete without a mention of some of the airframe changes that are found in the AH-1S. Perhaps the most important is this new 10 kVA alternator. It makes available through a rectifier 200 additional amps of DC power. That means that this new alternator or the start generator can operate the turret. Such redundancy provides a high degree of combat survivability and increases the probability of mission success if one system is damaged. This has just been an armament preview of the newest version of the Cobra, the AH-1S. Coupled with an already existing tow missile capability, it means that your aircraft can now bring an even greater variety of more potent firepower against a wider variety of targets. All Army aviation technicians perform valuable work, but when it comes to the 68M and JMOS, the work is perhaps even more important because nobody contributes more to the direct success of the aircraft in its specific combat mission than the work of you armament technicians. Another man's finger may be on the trigger, but in a very real sense, the weapons are in your hands. Five lines, six lines, four, three lines, five lines. Yeah, he didn't say left 200. Left 200. Where's the binos? Chief, there's normally two guys. No. Hey, the binos are in the day pack. I know. Right there. there is. Back there. See, up 40. And clock in. Impact. 
Putting together a massive jigsaw puzzle where most of the key pieces are missing. That may give you some idea of what the past year has been like for Master Sergeant Cliff Long. As soon as the donated AH-1 Cobra arrived, the mechanic knew restoring it would be a challenge. And it basically arrived in basically about five different boxes. Uh, and we're talking about multi-packs, huge four by four boxes. Even with all those parts, Long fell well short of what he needed to make the Cobra complete enough to be part of a static display at the Combat Readiness Training Center in Gulfport. 
the 1108th Aviation Group reached out for help across the Department of Defense. The Cobras have been uh, out of the system since about 1996. Uh, this aircraft came mostly stripped down and every part on it uh, was uh, donated by other DOD agencies and the word of mouth. The 1108 didn't hesitate to go the extra mile by installing some components that won't be visible to the public, like a working transmission. That's from the Guardsmen's desire to recreate memories as authentically as they can. Oh, we're going to go back to a basic paint scheme that the Army uh, paints, which is green. We're going to put all the markings, the original markings back, some uh, sharp teeth on the front because this is an attack helicopter. Uh, those that served in Vietnam, I mean, it's something that they'll see on the side of the road and they have to just stop. They have to walk over there and they have to look at it and they have to tell the loved ones or whoever they're with it, this airframe saved my life. Soldiers say this restoration is dedicated to those veterans who lost their lives in the name of freedom. For the Gulfport CRTC, I'm Daniel Thomas.